Dr. Jane Goodall, very warm welcome to you. It's a great, great pleasure um, to have you here. We just watched the movie about you, terribly well made, but of course the life behind it is as is much more inspirational, I would say, than the movie as, as such, but the movie's very well made. As, and I have, to, I have to say, first, before we start this conversation, I have to say I'm from the late 60s. And um, I would say, not only to me personally, but I think to my generation, your research and your work, it's very inspirational, but I think also the way you did it and your life in it, the way you did, the person who actually did it. To me personally, you've been very, very inspirational, I have to say, and, and, and there's so many levels in it, and there's so many things you could discuss about it, of course, and you could ask, and, and there are probably many people who would ask questions, different questions. Um, but I'd like to focus a little bit on a few questions on the aspect uh, which I think in many ways is, if you look at the, 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 the era, I mean the creation of the world, I mean how long mankind has been here, and that you for the first time maybe in human history reached out to another species. Um, we don't know, of course, but it looks like it. It's very probable that you were the first to reach out across sort of the species line to another species to, to befriend them. And in many ways, that's very inspirational and it's very telling. It's, it's, it's something which goes beyond maybe just a personal thing and becomes sort of a, a, a moment in the history of our, our species, of our world. Do you, can you remember, because it's not exactly in the movie, because it's probably before Hugo van Lauwe came to you, can you remember the first time that you sort of realized that you're reaching out across the line of our species to another species, the moment? <clears throat> well, no, because um, I, I, never, I never saw that line. That line was seen by science and drawn by science. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I grew up surrounded with animals and thinking about animals and watching them. Uh, I had my dog, Rusty, who taught me so much about our relationship and the fact that we are part of and not separated from the rest of the animal kingdom. So it was because I hadn't been to college. My brain hadn't been brainwashed, you know, by the scientists who believed that we were unique, we were one of a kind. The difference was one of kind and not degree. I didn't know that. Luckily, I didn't know it. And I've often wondered, had I gone to college, had I been taught that we were separate and, and somehow, you know, arrogance different and more superior. Would I have been brainwashed like that? I don't think so. I don't think so. But you can probably remember the first time, because you're saying also in the movie and you're described in your work, that it's been, it took a very long while to, to get them to, to, to get used to you. And it was frustrating. And, and can you can you still remember Greybeard when he f when you f when the moment when he first sort of didn't run away? Well, I can certainly remember this chimpanzee, David Greybeard, and you. <clears throat> we don't know why he was less afraid than the others. There's probably something in his past history, but you know I couldn't talk to him, so I, I couldn't ask. But. I remember vividly the first time I approached a group expecting them to run. I'd come too close to them by mistake and David Greybeard was sitting there and it was completely amazing. They took one look at me and they carried on with what they were doing and it was, it was total magic. I thought, I think it was the proudest moment of my life up to that time. They just sat there, they had accepted me. And that was about five months into the study when the money was already beginning to, you know, run out. It was just in time, actually. It was just in time. Yeah. And um, if you remember them, this first group you met, and you gave them names, um, you see them now in the movie, um, how do you look upon them? Are they friends? Well, people are always asking that. It's, mm -hmm. not, it's not like a human friend. No. Um, it's not like family. They're other beings, and it's a very special relationship. They trusted me. I trusted them. And they let me sit among them, and they carried on with their own business. And it was, it was very special. You still follow um, 
them in a way at the, the, the Gumbi River, that the research is still going on. Are there descendants of these? Do you know whether there are families who are still oh, connected? Oh, absolutely. In fact, what we know now, mm -hmm. uh, we couldn't uh, determine then because, you know, as you saw in the, in the movie with Flo and all her male suitors, yes. uh, one female has many suitors, so we, we didn't ever knew who the father was. We could guess. Uh, but now with DNA, we just collect up fecal samples, and once you have all, the entire group uh, with the DNA analyzed, we know now who the who the fathers are. So we have descendants from <coughs> Flo and Passion and Melissa, and we also have descendants of you know the males that I knew so well. So yes, we're still studying family histories. And the longer we stay, the more fascinating it becomes and the more new little quirks of behavior we witness. So it's the same, it's the same families, but they, 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 they don't grow as old as we, isn't it? So well, they, grow, more... they, they can live in the wild. They don't of, often live more than 60. The mm -hmm. oldest chimpanzee female in captivity was over 75 when she died last year. Little mama, I've known her all, you know, ever since. I went to America. Mm -hmm. So, but their generations are in the wild a little bit shorter than ours. So, so you have um, a long view on their family. You personally, because you you have yeah. several generations which you've known. Definitely, yeah. we're onto the fourth or maybe even the fifth now generation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, it's also it, it's a study, of course. Um, you've been conducting over all those decades on on chimpanzees, but what? If you would, but of course, uh, like Leakey said, it would, would tell something about our behavior and where we come from as a species, but maybe, may, maybe even more where we, where we go. What, what sort of, what, what to your idea, to your mind, does it teach, just looking at them, their behavior, what does it teach us about us? Well, I think it teaches us that we have, uh, from our distant ape-like, human-like, ancestor that led on the one hand to the chimps and on the other hand, well, chimps, orangs, gorillas, on the other hand to us, it teaches us that we, I think, have inherited some aggressive behaviors, but we've also uh, brought along with us love, compassion and altruism. We've got the two sides just as the chimps have. I think what separates us more than anything else is this explosive development of the human intellect. So we now know the chimps are way more intelligent than anybody ever thought. Captive chimps have been taught over 400 of the signs used by deaf people in America, a American Sign Language, ASL. Uh, they, they can communicate with their teachers and with each other using these signs, although obviously they mostly use their own, their own communication gestures. Um, they can make paintings and tell you what they've painted. Uh, we're learning all kinds of things about their intellect. But, I mean, we designed a rocket that went to the moon and a little robot that's been photographing the surface of the moon. And, uh, sorry, Mars, not the moon, I meant Mars. And uh, so we know we don't want to go and live on Mars. And it's very bizarre that the most intellectual being to ever walk the planet, which is us, is destroying its only home and destroying it so fast. So um, the biggest um, distinction maybe is that we're able to destroy everything. We are so. able to destroy everything. And it's not to say if the chimpanzees... See, I think it... I personally... There's a lot of controversy, but I think it's because at some point in our, in our past, we developed this spoken language. This, so for the first time, we can teach our children about things that aren't present, about things that happened in the past. Whereas chimpanzee children learn by watching, imitating, and practicing, which our children do as well. But we can bring people together from different um, walks of life and discuss problems and try and solve them. Seems we're not very good at this politically right now, but theoretically we should be able to. And so, you know, we, we, we have the brain to try and move out of this mess that we're in and we are coming up with technologies that enable us to live in greater harmony with nature and our own ecological footprints we can think about them and 
try and reduce them. And if we don't, and if we don't find new ways of thinking, what's it going to be like for our great-great-grandchildren? What's going to be left? Are you somber, somber about that? Are you, um, um, because if you look at the amount of woods around where chimps can live, you know, now compared to when you started in the early 60s, I mean, are you optimistic about it? Or well, I've been told that I'm an um, obstinate optimist. <laughs> so uh, the thing is that I think we have a window of time. But I don't think it's that big. I'm serious. And we've got to get together. I know we can do it, but will we do it in the time? I don't know. But why on earth else am I traveling 300 days a year around the world, giving talks, giving lectures, growing our youth program Roots and Shoots, helping young people to engage in projects that will make the world better for people, animals, environment, and trying to wake people up because I was given a gift of communication, and I have to use that, and I'm 84, so I don't know how much longer I have to speed up. People say, slow down. I say, no, I have to speed up. Because, of course, you don't know, but you're talking about a window of opportunity. How, how big should we think that is, is that, that window? Well, I think we'd better think it's quite small to put a you know, firework under our bottoms and get us out there doing things changing our own life. You know, that's one thing President Trump has done. He's woken people up in America. So for the first time, scientists are coming out of their ivory towers and demonstrating on the streets. They've never done that before about climate change and the need to, to stick to the, the, the uh, Paris Protocol. Yeah, that might be the good thing about it, you're saying. Yeah, that the only thing, the probably. Only, that, that, <laughs> But they should have made, maybe should have been doing that much earlier, but now they are finally on. But um, um, in a way, because you, you managed to um, uh, find your way into chimpanzee society um, by befriending them and by having patience. But in many ways, and you can see that in the movie as well, in many ways you uh, managed to get into the other to, into the world of the other half of our species, um, the male half of our, um, our species. Because when you were starting out, um, it was quite extraordinary uh, to, to pursue a scientific career as a woman. Yeah, but you see, when I started out, I wasn't planning to be a scientist, because mm -hmm. women weren't. Um, I was planning to be a naturalist. Mm -hmm. I wanted to go into the wild, live with animals, wild animals, and write books about them. That was my goal, any animal. And then I met Louis Leakey, and he really wanted somebody to go and study chimpanzees thinking if Jane finds behavior similar in chimps and humans today, it might have been present in the common ancestor six million years ago, and he could visualize better how early humans might have behaved. And he was searching for their fossilized remains. So I, I wasn't trying to break into any male world. And when I went out into the field, there weren't men doing it. I mean, it was right out there at the beginning. So I wasn't in competition with males back then. Uh, I had it all to myself. George Schaller and the gorillas, one year, that was it. <laughs> no, that's, that's right, but you're saying uh, I wasn't in competition with the males back then, later on? When competition with males? Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, when I went to Cambridge, and uh, it was a male-dominated world. And We're only, I think, the eighth person or the seventh person to be admitted into a PhD. Yes, eighth um, PhD without uh, a primary uh, degree. Yeah, 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 so... And I was resented. Um, and the professors were telling me I'd done everything wrong, that I shouldn't have given the chimpanzees names, for heaven's sake. That wasn't scientific. They should have had numbers. And I couldn't talk about personality, mind, or emotion because those were unique to us. And that's what I'd learned from my dog as a child, that the professors were wrong. And so I was able to stick to my guns. And that, since then it has become quite accepted, of course, that there's, um, um, uh, uh, that you can do studies about emotions in, in, in animals. So you proved to make sure you have the wrong scientific method. Yes, well, unfortunately, not everybody accepts it. And the people who don't accept that animals have 
emotions. Usually the people doing rather nasty things to them, like medical research, which still uses so many dogs and pigs and rats and the monkeys too, or the people who deal with the terrible, terrible, terrible conditions in the factory farms, and people who go sports hunting, all these nasty things we do. It's much easier for those people not to believe that animals have personality and emotions. So you think it's um, in a way an um, excuse or maybe even a setup to be able, uh, we as a species, to treat other species the way we treat them, to, to, to think that they don't have emotions? Well, yeah, I think it's, it's very helpful if you want to be cruel to them, mm -hmm. to believe that you're actually not <laughs> being as cruel as you probably know you are. I don't believe people don't believe it. I think it's convenient to say they don't, quite honestly. But, you know. That's, that's, I mean, that's a, a terrible insight into science. So it's underwriting our um, uh, uh, unethical behavior. Yeah, well, you know, one of the reasons I think why women haven't been pushing to get into science is because you're told you've got to be totally objective, and that means rather being cold and you can't, you mustn't, you mustn't, you mustn't have empathy for your subject. And that takes me back to a trip I made. I had to go and see Auschwitz because the pictures coming from the Holocaust when I was about, you know, at the end of the war mm -hmm. changed who I was. And I knew I had to go and s to, to just be in Auschwitz to try and experience it. And before going to Auschwitz, there's a museum in Berlin, which kind of explains everything. And I was with a German friend who could translate these letters. And the one I never will forget was from Himmler to the heads of the concentration camps, saying, it is to be expected that some of the guards will show empathy for the prisoners. This must be stamped out immediately. And you know, so when I used to compare what we do to the to the animals in medical research, there were a lot of people saying, "Well, you can't, you can't possibly compare humans with animals." But luckily, a concentration camp survivor wrote a book called *Eternal Treblinka*, which is about the conditions in medical research, and he compared it to his experiences in Treblinka. We've come far from this movie. We have. <laughs> but I think the movie, uh, um, at least, uh, and I'm sure there's still many people in the audience, I mean, gets you to points where uh, you have to contemplate these things. And that's one of the wonderful aspects of the movie, I would say. Oh, um, I, I hope people do start thinking. And, and I know some people do. They say, you know, I completely understand now about animals and how they have personalities. And I knew before, but this just brought it all out in my mind. And in that respect, how do you look upon how do you look upon eating meat? I mean, that's as a practical problem. Well, I don't. You don't. I mean, I don't eat it. No. <laughs> N nor do I. No. But um, 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 and I have to say this partly probably because of your research. But um, um, if you say that about medical practices, how should we go about as a as a species, as human, as mankind? You know, with with the way we eat or we. Well, Is that to, to starting, you jump from medical research, starting with the um, no, you, eating, yeah. eating, starting with eating meat. Mm -hmm. I stopped because of my concern for the animals in these intensive farms, uh, the horrible, horrible cruelty. But now, now one knows that as more people around the world eat more and more meat, as countries get richer, China, for example, there are now billions of animals in these horrendous factory farms. And uh, though the uh, amount of grain being grown for animals now exceeds the amount of grain being grown for humans across the planet. And huge areas of habitat, including rainforest, are destroyed to grow the grain. And then you have to use masses of fossil fuel to get the grain from the field to the animal, the animal to the abattoir, and the meat to the table. And then you have to waste masses of water changing vegetable protein into animal protein. And Finally, you know, the animals eat and gas comes out the other end, same for us, and that's methane. And that's the second most virulent gas. Well, it's actually the most virulent greenhouse gas 
but luckily not as plentiful as carbon dioxide. So there's so many, and then if, if you don't care about any of those things, if you don't care about the environment, you don't care about climate change, you don't care about animal cruelty, you probably care about your own health. And these animals are fed anti antibiotics routinely just to keep them alive, so the bacteria build up resistance. And now we have superbugs, and people are afraid to go to hospital because of these superbug infections. And that's mostly because of the misuse of antibiotics and animal agriculture. I'm not making that up as facts. No, I know, I know, you're not making it up. I'm so glad you're pointing it out because, I mean, you could already say that because the reason that, I mean, people are saying we can't feed our species on this planet, but we can if we don't eat meat. That's one of, I mean... Well, we can, can and also if we go back to small-scale family farming and we stop this monoculture, we stop this industrial agriculture, we stop the Monsantos and the DuPonts from spreading genetically modified food, which is causing more and more use of pesticide. We don't go into that now, but it's, it's a total nightmare. Yeah. And yeah. if anybody's interested, by the way, in GMOs, there's a book called Altered Genes, Twisted Truth. And it's by a man called Stephen Drucker. And he spent 15 years doing the research. He's a public interest attorney. And the book is so powerful that just recently it got translated into Spanish and it caused the Mexican government to ban genetically modified maize throughout the country, which is a super win. GMOs, yes. I mean, I wish the Americans would do that for the soya and, their, and, 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 and the Europeans would outlaw it. But, um, um, but coming back to one of the aspects at the end of the movie, and then maybe looking in the audience for questions, um, would you say that um, it, it matters that we think that we, um, like you're pointing out, we, we have language in which we can teach our children the things we've learned. And would you say that, would it, would it matter that we are aware of the difference and the responsibilities would come, to, would come with that as a species? Or would you say, no, it doesn't matter, we're the same. We're all the same um, no, in, in creation think, or in, no, in the world. No, I mean, I, I think this super development of the intellect, which is because I believe, mm -hmm. or at least partly because anyway, that we've developed this skill of the spoken of language, word or the yeah, written word, word. Uh, that we, we've, we've developed a brain that is able to ask, uh, is what we're doing moral and ethical? And discuss, is it moral and ethical? Which is something the chimpanzees can't do. They act the way they feel. And uh, our language sometimes expresses how we feel, like I could kill him, but we don't usually mean it. Uh, it, it's probably an ancient, ancient feeling that we have, I want to kill him, but we control it. We mostly control our aggressive instincts. Not always, but most of us, most of the time. And you know, if you, if you look at the news, look at the media, the world seems so terrible, and in some ways it is. But if, if the media thought that the good news was as newsworthy as the bad news, the good news would come out way on top. And there's far more people who are, who are kind and compassionate, considerate, considerate, decent citizens than the bad people who take the news headlines because they murder or take a bus and run over innocent school children, which gives us a wrong feeling of humanity. Or these fanatics in the different religions. But basically, you know, that's, that's the side that we can learn to keep away in our own lives. So you would say because we have language and because of the language we have, we are ethical beings, we can ask ourselves these questions. We are different and we have a responsibility to yes. care for the, the rest of yes. the planet or yes. ourselves yeah. or our children. Yeah. yeah, that's what I think. Yeah. Yeah. That's a very beautiful uh, thought, I would think. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much. We're not, we're not done yet. I'm sure there are people... Um, we have questions. Um, and here's, ah, yeah, Joost with the microphone. Um, and if there aren't, I would have many more, but <laughs> I'm sure. Don't be shy. Yes, lots coming up there. Okay. My name is uh, Beatrix, and 
I'm overwhelmed that you are here. I'm so grateful in the name of everybody here, I guess, in the whole of Holland. I just wonder how it would be possible to, for you to meet like with other people who are fighting against the uh, narrow-minded, money-making people misusing animals to make them stop, to make them reflect. And if you could use, uh, just unite with um, um, Mathieu Ricard, Mathieu Ricard and the Dalai Lama and, and, ho, and a, a lot of people, big elders, and just guide the, wor the world outside this cruelty. This, yeah? If it's possible. What was the actual question? I, I think um, you're saying that, wouldn't, I mean, how, I'm, I'm, I'm interpreting maybe, but um, 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 wouldn't it be possible for a few people to um, come together and lead us out of this um, sort of system in which we um, destroy the planet? Well, I think, I think that many people are, and I think the internet actually is helping that because views can be spread and shared uh, in a way they never could be before. And there's many people trying. There's many, many NGOs that are working for peace. Roots and shoots. Our young people are learning that whatever the color of your skin, whatever your religion, whatever your culture, whichever nation you come to, from, whether you're old or young, rich or poor, if you fall over and bleed, our blood is the same. If you cry, our tears are the same. So we're, we're learning that we are one family. And more and more people are concerned about what we're doing to the environment. If we destroy the environment, we have stolen the future of our children. So there's many, many people working on that. They're all on this side. Four, four more. Whoops. Hello. Um, I want to ask two questions. Um, first of all, when you mentioned that the community was breaking in the documentary, when you were mentioning the community was breaking up into two, up to that point you thought that chimpanzees were like us as humans, uh, but nicer. But when you saw the um, fight, it, it made you um, it made it difficult for you to come in terms with that. So I would like to ask you, why do you think there are two um, very opposite sides to them? Like, what do you, in your opinion, cause that um, aggression between them? And what was my second question? Oh, yeah, um, I, <laughs> I noticed that you mentioned more about the females in the community more than the male chimps. Was that a coincidence or was there a reason for it? No, I mean the, the, the study of females and males has always been about equal and I'm very fascinated in male dominance. I'm fascinated by the fact that uh, some males are much more motivated to a attain a high status and that they have different methods Individual males have different ways of getting to the top. Some use brute strength and aggression and swagger around and they're bullies. They usually don't last too long. I hope that applies to human politicians as well. Um, others are smarter and they only challenge a higher ranking male if they have an ally with them and so they cultivate allies. So that's fascinating, but I was always especially interested in the relationship of a mother and her growing family. And how, you know, when the, when the first child is five years old, the next baby is born, but the five-year-old continues to travel around with the mother and little baby brother or sister. And so the bonds between mother and child get closer, but the bonds between brothers and sisters begin to develop. And these are bonds which can last throughout life. So our study has always been equal of males and females. And uh, what was the other bit? I can't remember now. Which, why do we have two sides to our nature? Well, why do we yeah, have to so, but The question, the question is, I think about and what you're saying in the movie, that it was difficult for you to come to terms with the fact that they had war as well, um, because first you thought they were like us, but a little bit nicer. 
Um, well, I mean, they, you know, like us, they're just like us in this respect. We have an aggressive side. We have a kind, compassionate side. So do they. And there's in, in us a, a sort of, well, there was a book written called The Selfish Gene, which says everything we do is, is simply in order to do good for ourselves or our offspring. I happen not to believe that. I think there's much too much ethical behavior and we find it in animals too. It is not just for our own selves or our own genetic future. Would you agree in that respect? We had Frans de Waal here uh, not too long ago. And um, he, of course, um, in his research um, uh, says that um, there is um, inside every, not every, but inside the many animal species, there's the roots of ethical behavior. So indeed, uh, would you agree with him that there's... Yes, I yeah. definitely do. No. And you know, some of the, some of the things, YouTube has, is an amazing uh, way of learning about things because people now have their little videos with them and all kinds of things are captured on video that people wouldn't have believed. Now, here's something for ethical behavior uh, and relationship between different species. There's a, a video of a crow in a, in a car park and he finds an old bread roll and he's eating it. And then the camera catches a little mouse coming out on the other side and it's obviously a very hungry little mouse. And he goes towards the bird with the bread and then suddenly, oh, he loses his courage and scuttles back. And this happens three times. And then the mouse disappears and the bird has been watching and he breaks off a little piece of bread. He hops over, he drops it where the mouse disappeared and then hops back to his roll. Nobody would believe that if it wasn't filmed, right? You can look it up, see for yourself. <laughs> so I mean, these things, and that's something I want to do and I've got to get a volunteer to do it because it means trolling through all these YouTubes and picking out these examples of interspecies relationships and trying to get hold of the person who filmed it. And I, I just think it's totally fascinating. That would be the counter argument to the self esteem argument. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. There's another question here, I think. Was it a trained crow? Because in these YouTube films, I, some, I often have the impression that it's a trained, it's, it's not a natural thing, it's a trained thing, and so they get a, a, a very spectacular film and with many hits. So uh, if, if, the, if this is a natural situation that the crow does it, that would, but I don't, I'm very skeptical about well, crows. Well, you're completely right that most of them are trained animals. There's no question, absolutely no question. But this was out in a car park. It was very poorly filmed and it was very, it was very well, you watch it, it's all one. There's, the, there's no way the crow was trained to feed a mouse. Go, look it up and you'll see. More questions? Yes, thank you. Ah, no. <laughs> I'm afraid we can't... Um, um... Yeah. Jane, do the shrimps always use the same uh, trees to make a nest? Do they come back to the same nest or they, do they use every time a new tree? They, are, they move for food from place to place. So they very seldom end up uh, in the place where they made the nest the night before. Uh, if they do, they sometimes use an old nest, but they always put fresh bedclothes on top. They, <laughs> they bend over more, more leaves. And, and uh, uh, the crow uh, use also tools to... Um, yeah, they do. They yeah. crawls use um, uh, spikes and that sort of things. Thank you. Um, I'm trying, I'm sure we can't, you know, um, um, I have all the questions, that's why I'm speeding it up But you a can, bit, but you can contact the Jane Goodall Institute Netherlands and send your questions there and they will get to me if they can't answer them. Um, I uh, noticed in the film that uh, Flint got very dependent of Flo. Uh, how do you, why do you think uh, that Flint actually uh, kept being so dependent on his mother? He, w he was very dependent because although it didn't show it in the film, Flo had one more infant and Flint was only four. Usually the next child uh, is born when the older one is about five. Flint was very young and he was very upset when his mother tried to wean him. She let him go on riding on her back. She let him sleep in her nest at night. 
and when the baby died, she was all ready to take on a baby, so she took Flint back as her little baby, and so he had a very abnormal time. He was still, well, her milk dried up, but he was still sleeping with her when he was eight. He was still riding on her back, even though sometimes she collapsed under his weight because she was so old. And so this is why he just couldn't cope without her. He'd passed the time when he should have become independent, which is when, you, you know... Okay. <laughs> um, a lot, sorry, a lot part of your knowledge is due to your ability and uh, privilege to have observed the animals in the wild. What do you think for all the all of us normal people who, who don't have that experience is the equivalent um, in in urban um, environments? Do you think there's a function for zoos to educate people and? Um, teach them about the, the importance of, of animals and nature? Or do you think keeping animals in captivity is the wrong thing to, to go it, about? I think that? it depends. And if you do, is, is there an option for the zoo yeah. of the future? Yeah, I think there's, uh, it depends on the zoo. The improvement I've seen in zoos over my time on the planet is just unbelievable. There's still some really bad zoos. There are animals that never should be in a zoo, like elephants and whales and, and dolphins, uh, probably wolves as well, because they just need to run, and wild dogs. But um, chimpanzees now, the good zoos have really big enclosures. They have lots of enrichment. In other words, boredom is something terrible for animals in captivity. But people begin to understand more about the needs of the different animals. The keepers are highly trained. Uh, they're not doing keeping as a job, as used to be the case when I was young. Uh, they do it because they really care and they'll stay long over hours if the animal is sick or something. And there's an a sort of ideal that animals need to be free and in the wild, which if all things were equal would be true. But I see chimpanzees in really good enclosures in zoos uh, where people can indeed get the same they can look them in the eye, they can get that same feeling of here's another being with a personality and a mind that I should respect. And out in the wild, you're listening for the approaching chainsaw, you're caught in wire snares, there are hunters shooting your mother to, to sell you into uh, entertainment or something in China, or to, uh, to eat the, you know, for the bushmeat trade. And so I think a really good zoo can give people an, a passion for conservation. And the really good zoos are using a lot of money to do co programs in the, the country where the animal species comes from. So. Last question, I'm afraid. Joost. Hello, uh, my name is Leon. Thank you for your good work. Um, Dr. Leakey uh, was taking a great risk to put a young, unschooled girl into the bush. Uh, how did people look at him that time? Because the chance of uh, failure was probably bigger than uh, succeeding this project. Well, I think most people hadn't the faintest idea what was going on. You know, today there'd be a, a flurry on the internet, wouldn't there? There'd be all Facebook pages and everything. But back then, you know, there wasn't even a computer back then. Um, and so most people didn't know about it. Uh, Leakey had a passion for this sort of thing. And he was, you know, he just did what he wanted. He kind of plowed for it. I wanted to do it. I had an amazing mother who just allowed, not only allowed me, but came out in the early days because the authorities wouldn't allow me on my own. They said I had to have a companion, so mum volunteered. So uh, th there wasn't any feeling of uh, Leakey's not responsible, I think. It was just, well, it's a bit of a crazy idea. And if it had gone wrong, it would have died without a ripple, I think. <laughs> um, you're saying in the movie that, one, that the chimpanzee Seas are a male-dominated species, and when you started out your research, you could say for hundreds or maybe thousands of years, our species had been a male-dominated species. 
Um, so it's interesting, and I understand that it's one of the things you're, you're, you're doing in your research is how does that work. It's interesting what you're saying about the social males and the more aggressive males and the, those sort of differences. Um, would it be possible actually that after many generations, maybe many thousands of years of male dominant, of being a male dominant, dominated species, and we have seen over the past decades seen that change, and would that be possible that it really changes? In human society. In, humans, in human behavior. Yeah, well, we are so changing it, aren't mm -hmm. we? We're working very hard to change it. Mm -hmm. And I always think the thing I like best is a, a Latin American tribe, I forget which one or even which country, but they say that their tribe is like an eagle and one wing is male and the other wing is female and only when the two wings are equal will the tribe fly true and that's the goal that we should have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for being here. It's been great speaking to you. Thank you very much.